This is the top 10 fallacies, mistaken beliefs, faulty reasoning, and unsound arguments in Judaism. Top 10. First one, the covenant of friendship that comes with Moshe, the anointed one of Isaiah 11, the descendant of King David, and promises of Jeremiah 31, refute a Messianic era. Rambam says in his Mishnah Torah that in the Messianic era, Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will therefore be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. He also says, at their time, <clears throat> at that time, there will be no hunger or war, no jealousy or rivalry, for the good will be plentiful and all delicacies available as dust. The entire occupation of the world will be only to know God. The people of Israel will be of great wisdom. They will perceive the esoteric truths and comprehend their creator's wisdom as is the capacity of man. Rambam made every bit of that up. That's not in the scripture. Nothing even close to that. But what do we have when Moshiach comes? Well, there's two covenants yet to be delivered. The covenant of Jeremiah 31, the covenant that God says he will write Torah on everyone's heart and everybody will heed him because he will forgive their sins and remember them no more. Sin forgiveness, that's what that covenant is. The other covenant comes with David. It's called the covenant of friendship. And it differs markedly from this time that Rambam's talking about. That's not in the scripture. Here's what's in the scripture. The covenant of friendship with Moshe, the descendant of King David. In the day of the Lord, when Moshe comes, this is where the words of Rambam should be if they were God's words. But they are not. They're Rambam's words. And that's not scripture. Here's what God promises in his covenant of friendship. He will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil and never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. There shall be no, they shall <clears throat> no more be carried off by famine. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. They shall know that the Lord their God is with them, and they, the house of Israel, are his people. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. Never defeated and uprooted again. No longer the taunts of nations. Those are the highlights. God's coming to return to his temple. Of course, we know there's not one built. Elijah clears the way for him. It is Elijah that makes sure the temple gets built for his return. His presence shall rest over them, and when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. There's nothing in here about perfecting the world and the whole world being to know nothing but God. There's nothing like that. It's supposed to be a time of, in the, the Messianic era where there's no sin. 
He just made it up. He's a religious man, and that would be the perfect world for him. But that's not in the scripture. I just read to you what the scripture said. That's what God says. This is what I'm going to do for you. Israel shall bloom again. I'm going to place my sanctuary there. So he already knows when he has this written in Ezekiel, he already knows the temple's not going to be there in the day of the Lord. And that's where he's, when he says, I'm coming back, return to my temple suddenly. But he's saying right here, I'm going to place it. I'm going to place it. He's going to use, he's going to use Moshe, the righteous servant, Elijah, a prophet like Moses to clear the way for him. The Messianic era that is said to begin when the anointing wood comes, whom God calls his servant David, a shepherd. He's not King Moshe. That's another thing Rambam just made up. He's got two full chapters in the Mishnah Torah called King Moshe. All these things King Moshe is going to do and establish the Davidic covenant and dynasty. None of which is in the scripture. He's a shepherd. He's a teacher. Not a rabbi. He's a teacher. And he was believed by the early sages and rabbis of antiquity to be described in Isaiah 53. And the Babylon Talmud called him the leper scholar. So despite these two fabricated chapters of Rambam's mission of Torah on King Moshe, David is appointed the only shepherd not dismissed by God. One of the top ten things Judaism just refuses to acknowledge is that when Moshe comes, and he comes with the covenant of friendship, God has a reckoning and dismisses all of the shepherds and will only recognize Moshe as a shepherd amongst the flock. Not over, not ruling, not a king, among the flock. And I'm going to get to this shortly. You can't get around it. But I'm Moshe. God first spoke to me 13 years ago. And in this top 10 things, fallacies of Judaism, I want to get to better explanations of that. But recognize this. He gave me all this knowledge. This is how I know these things. The Messianic era fails to take into account God's reckoning and dismissal of the rabbis and having the glory of the people hurled to the ground by God of Isaiah 63 and utter destruction to the land of Malachi 3 if God's representation of Isaiah 53 is not recognized, who is the Moshiach of Isaiah 11. Now, I believe the realities of the day of the Lord, which is here, and I'll get to that, and the days of Moshiach will be much better than what Mr. Rambam had to say. Utopia is not here, and it doesn't fit humanity. Man is not made to live in utopia on earth, period. It doesn't fit our nature. So, utopia is not here. There will be no Messianic era. You're not going to be the taunts of nations. God's going to set his temple amongst you. Never be uprooted again, and the land will flourish, which, of course, it's already done. It blooms again. Second, second, the top ten fallacies of Judaism. And this, is, this has got to be one of the biggest. The Holy Spirit, also known as the Spirit of the Holy God, also known as the Angel of His Presence, and also known as the Angel of the Lord, is a person. Judaism does not recognize the Spirit of God as being a person. And as you'll see, that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. 
God created all things, including spirit and souls, that together form persons. The first person he created was the person of his spirit, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about it. You, I mean, your spirit is always with you. Okay, and he's got an angel of his presence. That means that angel is always with him. Do the same person, as I'll get to. This is from Isaiah 63, verses 9 and 10. And all their troubles, he was troubled. And the angel of his presence delivered them. In his love and pity, he himself redeemed them. That's the angel of his presence. Raised them and exalted them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Then he became their enemy and himself made war against them. Well, we know the angel of his presence is his person. And the Holy Spirit is grieved. We, if you're an inanimate element of the unseen, you can't be grieved. To be grieved, you have to be a person. Now, I don't know why Judaism can't read that. And it's very important. Because, because it's why Judaism doesn't understand what a man in divine beings is. A host of the Lord's host, which I also will be getting to. There are still three men to come in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, two covenants, three more men, Moshe, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. Each of these great men were righteous, and all three were servants of God. They're all righteous servants. One more man to come is God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. The Moshe, the Moshe, the anointed one. Well, this is where you find out his main anointment. It's to make the many righteous. Anointing to do what? Why is he the anointing? What's he going to do? Primarily, we see he's going to make the many righteous. So you got four righteous servants and only one description. God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is implicitly and explicitly all four men. Now, that's a heck of a Moshe if you think about it. He's God's righteous servant. He's Moshe, the descendant of uh, King David. He's Elijah and, and the prophet like Moses. I mean, you figure the last prophet of God is really going to be something. And what it really means is he's got a lot of things to do because he's got to handle the task, for instance, writing. Okay, that way you would look to the prophet like Moses, write God's words, because he wrote the Torah. God dictated it to him. Elijah, you want to find out things about heaven. The only man specifically taken to heaven, and he returns. Well, what does he know? Well, he knows how angels are created, and I'm about to get to that. The sages knew you had to have a description of Moshe, and it was Isaiah 53. They called Moshe the leper scholar. Of course you have to have the description. Four righteous servants, one description. It has to, he has to be all four. Okay, I am Moshe, God's righteous servant, which means I'm also Elijah and the prophet like Moses. But my name is Keith. As Elijah, God has taught me all the matters of heaven I may need as a proof including how the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, was created. It is important for understanding how God is in his spirit. Again, our spirit is within us. We're in our spirit, our spirit is in us. Wherever God's presence is, his spirit is. Wherever God's presence is, the angel is. The short answer is this. I'm about to read it. God created an angel, and for his body... He made his own spirit the body of that angel. It doesn't have the human form and wings. Here's how he did it. 
He created a special soul because we, this is the Holy Spirit of God, his constant companion. So he's a person far above any of us. God creates a special soul and places it before his face and speaks the words, I am. But God does not use his voice. He becomes the person he is creating. He uses the childlike voice of an angelic person. He speaks to the angel as God and answers for the angel as the angel himself in a childlike voice. God simulates being this new person for ages and ages until he is perfect as God would have him be. Then God releases that special soul into his spirit from before his faith with a breath of life. And the person of the Spirit of God was created, an angel whose body is the Spirit of the Holy God, the Holy Spirit, and he is a person. Angels are people, persons. God is always in him. God was him. God can always place the person of his Spirit before his face and be him, and speak as him and through him. And this is how God, my name, Hashem, is in the angel that was sent to guard the Israelites on the way to the promised land, and in the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. You know, Moses, it says when Moses saw the burning bush, the angel of the Lord was in the bush, and God speaks. Well, that's how it happened. And nobody in Judaism knows this. First of all, they rule out that the Holy Spirit is even a person, and they, if they recognize an angel of his presence, I've never seen it. They're the same angel, the angel of God's presence, angel of the Lord. Despite the teaching of Judaism, to the contrary, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, is a person. If God's Holy Spirit can be grieved, he is a person. Only a person can be grieved. God is not spirit. He created all things, including spirits and souls, that together form persons. Persons of spirit, persons of angels, and the persons of human beings. God is absolute power and absolute knowledge. And he is a person. This is from um, Exodus 23, verses 20 through 22. I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses, since my name, since Hashem, is in him. Judaism doesn't even see it. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. The angel sent before the Israelites in the Exodus is the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit. Where God dwells and moves about as he did with Moses and the Israelites, his Holy Spirit is with him. In Isaiah 63, when the Israelites grieved, his Holy Spirit, God became their enemy and himself made war against them. More proofs of the person of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel says in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, And he, God, said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me, and set me upon my feet, and I heard what was being spoken to me. God is in his spirit. His spirit lit upon and entered Ezekiel, and upon entering him, he can now hear God's voice. He's a man in divine beings. He's got an angel, a Holy Spirit within him, and God, both are persons, divine beings, plural. So when Jacob wrestles with an angel, you know, he said, I wrestled with a man of nine days. 
Well, that's all it was. God just went to a man and said, I need you to go wrestle with this fellow. We're going to come with you. You're not an angel. That man was not an angel. He was just being directed and commanded what to do by God in his spirit within the man. They had entered him. Okay, so what happens in Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2? The anointed one, descendant of David, the Spirit of God alights upon him. Well, just as with Ezekiel, alights upon him and enters, and God is in his spirit. Moshe instantly becomes a man of divine beings. Further showing the person of the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel says, The presence of the Lord ascended from the midst of the city and stood on the hill east of the city. Now what do we have? Ezekiel has a spirit in him and God is in him. In this particular verse and chapter, uh, chapter 11, verses 23 through 25, God is showing that he is still one. He ascends. He leads Ezekiel in the spirit. Rises over the walls of Jerusalem and goes and stands upon a hill, it says. East of the city. And then this. A spirit carried me away and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God to the exile community in Chaldea. The spirit of God is taking Ezekiel in a vision. He's using a spirit to do it. Another spirit. So that means he's got to be a person. And God's showing why I am in my spirit. My spirit's in me. I'm still one. We are separate and apart from each other. We're just always together. It's like two clouds. The presence of God. Some elements of the unseen. It's his mind. It's where he feels he is. The Holy Spirit. Well, he's made of spirit. Elements of spirit. Like clouds, they have floated together and basically merged. But they're still separate. They're, they're completely different entities. But if the Spirit alights upon you, and anytime you see a prophet say God's word, the Spirit of God has led upon and entered him, and God is in the Spirit. But they are separate. But, but here again is an example that the Holy Spirit is a person, the Spirit of God. Took Ezekiel on a vision. I don't know how Judaism misses it. So, you know, the power to take a man into a vision comes from God. Holy Spirit doesn't have power. The only entity in the unseen realm of God with power is God himself. He doesn't give power to angels. If they got to do something, he's behind it. So, Ezekiel says, When he returns and he says, and he tells the exiles all the things the Lord had shown him. The Lord had shown him. But it's the Spirit of God that took him on the vision. That he's telling the exiles, this is what the Lord. So basically, the Lord became a part of the vision. Even though he's standing on a hill again, it was to show his oneness and the separation between the two. These are the things as Elijah God taught me. I mean, he's been he had to teach me the scripture. I was an atheist for 50 years. First thing he said was, uh, we need to go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. And I said, what's a Tanakh? I had never read the Bible. That was 13 years ago. Next. Third of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. A host of the Lord's host. 
Here's the story of Jacob. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket, so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he 